Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Last, the last couple of lectures, we talked about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And today, we'll talk about the role of thinking, of cognition and learning, because we haven't talked about that before. The early behaviorists, people like Skinner, didn't believe that thinking played much of a role in learning. So we call them SR psychologists. They believed that the reward would stamp in the connection between the stimulus, say the lever, and the response, which would be pushing it. And the rat doesn't have to understand anything for that to happen. It's some kind of an automatic process. That's okay, so there wasn't a role for cognition. And, and they would say, okay, well, yeah, people do have thoughts and feelings, but, you know, those are behaviors too. And they're ones that we can't see. So we're not interested as scientists in them because we can't observe them. And they wanted to be uh, hard-nosed empiricists and only study things that you can see and record objectively. And they would say, no, those, those are behaviors, thoughts and feelings, but since we can't see them, we're not interested and they're irrelevant because this process doesn't need them. However, that's not how um, most psychologists today think of it because we know that there is some role for cognition. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in fear conditioning studies, um, let's say when you're training somebody to be afraid of some stimulus because they might um, get some, let's say, unpleasant little shock. If you tell them, or you give them the, the cognitive knowledge, we're going to stop delivering the shocks now. The, the next presentation of the stimulus doesn't evoke the, the fear response as, as greatly. So something about thinking matters. And uh, I'll just take a second. I think someone has their microphone on. I'm getting some feedback. Okay. Uh, where were we? Um, ah, yes. Uh, the the importance of, of cognition and of, of expectations in uh, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. In operant conditioning what people think of the reward matters as well. So let's say that um, you get a B on your next exam. Is that a, a reward or, or a punishment? Well, well, it depends. It depends on, on what you expect. And it depends on what you value. For some people who are really into getting A's, they'd, they'd be quite upset by that. Um, for others, let's say if you're used to getting lower grades, then that might feel like a reward. And for other people who don't really care that much, it just doesn't, doesn't mean much. So we can't just assume that something is a reward or a punishment for somebody based on, on our beliefs. What they think about it also matters. And now let's say you send your, your kid to their room for bad behavior. That's only a punishment if it serves to decrease the, the frequency of whatever the, the behavior was that, that you sent them for their room for doing. But there's an assumption on the part of many parents, many teachers, many psychologists that this is, this is a punisher. And really, um, maybe the kid's happy to get away from me, right? or maybe um, they feel proud of being sent to the, the principal's office and, and standing up to the teacher. So what, what the organism thinks and expects does matter, and matters more for humans, because we do a lot more thinking. So the SR psychology has given way to SOR psychology, where you put the organism and what it thinks and expects in, in the middle of the process. There. The way they respond to the stimulus depends on how they interpret it, what the meaning of it is to them, and, and what they expect. 
Now, there's more evidence for the importance of cognition in learning beyond simple reward and, and punishment. And that's that we just learn kind of automatically by being in situations, even when we're not rewarded for it. When you are wandering around campus, you're learning the lay of the land. You don't need to be rewarded for that to work. And this has been demonstrated with studies of rats in, in mazes. So Tolman and, and Haas, Hansik, Haas, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Anyway, these researchers put rats in mazes and uh, counted or measured the amount of time it took them to get through the maze. And some of the rats were given a reward for getting to the, every time they got through to the end of the maze. And then some of the rats were um, never reinforced. So they get to the end of the maze and you know, you don't give them any food for having done that. And then there was a, another group where they didn't reward them for getting to the end of the maze. But then in, in the middle of the experiment, you can see here on the x-axis, there's days of experience in the maze. They started reinforcing them. And what happened is that their um, performance in the maze, measured as how quickly they got through it, suddenly got a lot better. And what that indicates is that when they had been in the maze and they weren't being reinforced for it, they were learning something. So once they got reinforced, they got through it quite quickly. So that what that demonstrates is that the time that they spent in the maze sniffing around meant something. Like they learned something even though they weren't being reinforced. And then when they were being reinforced, they, they pulled that knowledge out and they were able to demonstrate better performance than the rats who were never reinforced. And so the fact that that happened at all challenges radical behaviorism, which would say, well, you know, you only learn when there's a reward. We can also learn just by watching other people. So if you watch somebody do something and get hurt from it, you might not go do that thing. But if you see someone, if you see other people being rewarded for a certain kind of behavior, then you are likely to go and repeat that behavior, expecting that you also will be rewarded or punished for doing it. Okay, so there's, in that case, there's no direct experience, right? You're not the one doing the behavior and you're not the one being rewarded or punished, but that can, just seeing that can change your behavior. And there is a famous research on aggression by Albert Bandura, and it's about how watching someone be, someone act aggressively can then influence the observer, in this case there were children, to act aggressively. And uh, there were, when we talk about these famous studies, it's not like there was one experiment. Usually these were highly controlled studies where they did many, many different versions of the experiment where they tried this and they tried that. And, you know, and maybe in one version, they'll say, let's reward the person for acting aggressively. And another one, they'll say, okay, let's, let's punish the person for, for acting aggressively. And then let's see whether um, the children repeat this aggressive behavior. But what the, the fundamental experiment was, was um, they had uh, children come into the lab and play with toys. And there was also an adult in there and uh, that, that was playing with the toys. And there were some cooler toys and there were some not so interesting toys. And there was also something called a Bobo doll. And that's a, a big kind of inflatable doll with a weight in it that rocks back and forth. And 
And one of the, the conditions I had the child witness um, the, the adult who had been provoked in some way, I can't remember how, um, go off on the Bobo doll and insult it and, and beat it around and uh, you know, abuse the Bobo doll. And in another condition, there being a control condition where that, that wouldn't have happened. What the experimenters then did was do something to piss the kid off, which was to say, these nice toys are not for you to play with. Um, you, know, you go play with these you know, less, less interesting tinker toys. So, so they hurt the kid's feelings a bit, and then they, they left it in the room with, um, or left them in the room with the toys and the Bobo doll. And they were interested in seeing, how's the kid going to treat the Bobo doll? And kids who had seen the adult abuse the doll uh, went and were more likely to go and, and do that and to, to, to do what they saw, right, to, to punch it and, and to insult it. But the, the kids who hadn't seen that didn't do that. And so it demonstrated that um, uh, aggression is something that, that we can model, you know, especially when the person who does that is somehow reinforced for it. But just seeing it is, you know. We're likely, we don't copy the behavior of everyone in the same way. We're more likely to copy the behavior of people who have high social status. And there's a lot of interest in what, you know, uh, well, Princess Kate is doing and, and what celebrities are doing and what they own and what they're wearing and, and what, I don't know, what, what kind of jacket Zelensky is, is wearing. And that status, that their position in the hierarchy, the fact that they have more resources and, and things are going better for them, suggests that whatever they've been doing has resulted in, in reward. Okay, like what they're doing must be the right thing to do because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. And so we expect that if we do what they do, then things will also go well for us and, and we'll have more approval and more status. If we wear uh, Kate Middleton's dress, then people will be impressed. And, and this is why advertisers love celebrity endorsements. But they don't go and uh, get somebody who is is not considered high status to endorse the product. So they'll pay a lot of money for Rihanna to wear their makeup, but they're not going to go to the local women's prison and see if that color works on someone there. Even if it looked great on them, they're not going to do that. That wouldn't help them sell the lipstick. There's been a lot of um, concern about media violence, uh, especially in the context of kids. So does um, watching violent video games, does watching violent cartoons or movies uh, increase the likelihood that people will act aggressively? And there's been a lot of research on this and there's been different kinds of research. Remember from our research methods unit that every type of research study has some kind of problem with it. So the randomized control trials don't um, have such great external validity. And then the, the case studies, which can be com uh, personally compelling, don't have good internal validity. But there's now enough research from of different kinds that have different strengths and limitations. And those strengths and limitations cover for each other, which is why when you want to study some phenomenon, do it um, six different ways and, and look at the big picture. And the big picture suggests that yes, um, it's media violence does increase the probability of people acting aggressively. And uh, there's, you know, there's more than one thing going on there. It's not just that you're seeing the violence. It's also often somebody that's kind of attractive and high status that's doing it. And there's a story that when they're doing it, it's 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 righteous or an attitude there is. Right? Like nobody tells James Bond 
that he violated the rights of the accused and that vigilante justice and extrajudicial killings are not okay. And that never ever happens, right? He never pays for the destruction of, of property. Right? And, and you'll also see them um, engaging in violence and then not paying any of the costs for it whatsoever, not just the, all the, the, the damage of, of property, but also you'll see them surviving falls and impacts that would just leave you injured for the rest of your life if you even survived it, right? Like they survive falls and impacts that just aren't possible to survive. So, and, and explosions, like how many times have you seen somebody like running through an explosion without like their hair getting burned at all? Like not, not hair is singed, like that, that's not possible. So the media violence kind of suggests that um, it's rewarded, that high status attractive people do it and that there's really no cost to it. If, if anything at all, it, uh, you, it helps you achieve your goals and, and look cool and, and be admired at the end. It makes it look like an unrealistically good way to solve problems. That said, um, it's one piece of a puzzle, right? It's, it's one contributor. And in, in the, the scope of things, you have to wonder, well, well, how much does this really add? So if you looked at the rates of, say, you know, homicide, how much is that due to the fact that uh, maybe that person watched some violent TV shows and, and how much of it is the effect or, or bigger social causes like poverty, right, or um, cycles of violence? Those are probably bigger, right? Like how much of, of what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine now is, is due to TV shows? Probably a, a drop in the bucket. There's neuroscientists uh, found evidence of something called mirror neurons, and we know very, very little about them. So what neuroscientists know about everything, if everything we needed to know about the brain was, was a mile, uh, the, the greatest neuroscientists maybe know two inches. And then there's me. And, and what I understand of that is like a, an, an iota. And so uh, this is mysterious and I'm not an expert at it either, but there's, there are some neurons in our brains that respond when someone else undergoes something the same way they would respond if it actually happened to us. And um, some researchers discovered this when they were uh, trying to find out what part, what neurons were responding when um, a chimpanzee was, was eating something, a, a treat. And then one day they, they had the setup going and it was a hot day and they walked to the lab and they were eating ice cream cones and they detected activity in these neurons, even though the chimpanzee wasn't having any kind of treat, but it was watching them. So, those are called mirror neurons. We don't know that much about them. Sounds interesting. But it looks like they have some role in observational learning and in, in empathy for others. The original meaning of the term passion, right, the, the first meaning, if you look up the noun passion, is to suffer. And then that word in the dictionary goes through, you know, there's a few other other meanings of the word, like I think maybe. Um, and another meaning is, is like it's a, a sickness or a strong emotion. And that the last and latest meaning of the word passion is the, the kind you'd associate with like love. And, and that, that was it's almost like a corruption of the term. I don't know if corruption is the right word, but it, over, over time, the word started to mean different things. But originally, uh, passion means to suffer and compassion is to suffer with somebody else. You can see that when, this in the first picture, these are the parts of the brain that are activated when somebody is experiencing some painful stimuli. And then this other image shows activation when, when they're watching somebody else experience that stimuli. It's not as much activation, but you can see that there are similar areas. 
okay? So we can feel pain along with others. We can feel happiness along uh, with others too. There's also evidence for insight learning. And that's the idea that suddenly, somehow, you put it all together and you understand what's going on. Um, Polar was a scientist who worked with chimpanzees and he would give them kind of problems to solve, like how to get at bananas that are placed out of reach. And it looks like there's some kind of aha moment probably has something to do with, with your association cortex when you're able to bring it all together, understand the problem at a higher level and figure out the solution. Cats in Thorndike's puzzle boxes never showed evidence of that aha moment. For them, it looked like they were just scrambling around in the box through trial and error, finally did something that opened the box but then when you put them back in the box it didn't seem to like get it and immediately go do that thing again and get out of the box that didn't show that they understood what they would do is just scramble around again and then finally haphazardly do that behavior again that, that got them out of there and over time, if you keep repeating this and you put the cat in the box a hundred times, eventually it gets faster and faster at performing that response. But it takes a long time and they never seem to get it. And the thing that they do in order to open the box may not be the most efficient thing. If you have an aha moment, then it makes sense that, um, you know, you'd, uh, let's say, push the lever to get out of the box and, and use your hand or your paw to do that. But if they, um, if they did, were able to push down that lever by rolling around on their back and, uh, you know, taking their feet somehow, right, something really inefficient, they'd end up doing that, repeating that behavior. So it doesn't show insight, doesn't show understanding. But some animals, like chimpanzees and humans, do have that higher level of understanding. So that's another line of evidence for the importance of cognition and learning. You know, if if there was no role of thought in learning, why would you be in this class, right? Just the fact that we're here doing this at all is, uh, I think, enough to show that uh, the cognition matters to learning. Um, when I'm trying, I'm trying to find the words for what I want to say next. We are biologically prepared to learn some associations more readily than others. Think about the things that people have phobias over. You know, like what are the most common phobias or things like uh, fear of heights, uh, fear of bugs, um, or snakes or, or yucky things, fear of, um, of, of blood, fear of, of maybe illnesses. But how many people have uh, a phobia of cars or uh, electrical outlets or these modern things that actually harm us more often, that we're more likely to be injured by? It's almost as if we have a predisposition to be afraid of stimuli that matter, that had a greater chance of harming our early ancestors. You know, things like snakes and, and heights, okay? So we're prepared, we're predisposed to be more afraid of certain things based on our evolutionary history and the experience of, of many, many generations of our ancestors. And, and these can make us more likely to form certain illusory correlations. So if there's some kind of a accidental relationship between um, like a 
a snake and, and something bad happening. Uh, so you'd show this in a lab by showing pictures. Let's say you're going to deliver a little um, electric shock to, to certain um, pictures shown as stimuli. And let's say you're just as likely to shock the subject for showing, a, I don't know, fluffy cute kitten as showing a snake, as showing a piece of food or some landscape. People are just more likely to form that conditioned association to, to the snake out of those other images. Uh, we are particularly likely to condition um, illness to taste. And, and it makes sense. You can, you can see why. This can happen after only one trial. If you eat something for the first time and you get really sick afterwards, you might never want to eat that food again. But let's say you ate that food at a restaurant, how likely is it that um, your fear was conditioned to the waiter or the tablecloth or the hardwood floor? Right? Not likely at all. Your body's very ready to associate the illness, which could happen like eight hours, 10 hours later with food. And, and that itself is, is interesting because when your when researchers are trying to condition a response to a stimuli to a, a previously neutral stimuli something like a tone uh, you have to present the say the food or the shock or whatever you're using really soon after in order for that to work like within a few seconds right? you can't condition a dog to salivate to to a tone by sounding the tone eight hours before the food comes, right? That, that just doesn't work. But that does seem to work with um, illness. And, and it makes sense why, right? Because it, it's, it would have been easy for your ancestors to die from, um, from poison food, right? from spoiled food. And so being super, super ready to make that association has a lot of adaptive value. Interesting is also quite specific. Um, it doesn't generalize well. So if you um, form a, that, as, that association, that, that conditioned aversion to a certain kind of food, it's, it's not likely to generalize to even pretty similar food. And again, we, there's that technique um, with people who are getting chemotherapy to use a, a scapegoat food. And then to focus that whole condition taste aversion on one particular kind of food. And there's not much chance that it'll generalize to, to other kinds of food. There is a famous study on condition taste aversion by Garcia and Kell probably mispronouncing this, Kelling. Um, it was called the Bright Noisy Tasty Water Experiment. And uh, I'm seeing a, a comment in the chat saying, I did that exactly this over reading week. I'm currently avoiding two foods in particular because I started to feel sick after eating them. Yeah, it's, um, it's a strong response. And uh, I know people who've avoided certain kind of food for basically the rest of their life after uh, for getting sick once. Um, so in this uh, this experiment, what um, the researchers did was pair water with either um, illness or foot shock. But <laughs> what they did was um, either well they had two different kinds of water. So they put, um, in one case, they had flavored water. So they put a flavor in the water. That's tasty water. And in another condition, they, um, well, while the animal was drinking the water, presented with the water, 
they shone a light and played a sound, right? Like there was like, like a buzzing sound. And they, they called that bright, noisy water. And then after either the rats got the tasty water or the bright, noisy water, the experimenters gave them either an x-ray, or I exposed them to x-rays that made them feel sick, or they delivered foot shock, right? They delivered electric shock to the floor of the cage. And take a look at the results of this study. So in, in this first graph, we have the, um, the radiation condition, okay? So all of these rats were um, given the exposed to, to radiation that made them feel sick. And some of them were given the tasty water and some of them were given the bright, noisy water. And you can see how much water they were drinking before conditioning, and then how much they were given after conditioning. So how much water they drank after conditioning. And they're thirsty rats. Okay, so this graph is for those that were exposed to x-rays, to radiation that makes them feel sick. And in the second graph, they were given foot shock. I'd like you to just take a moment, look at this graph, and, and think about what it means. Okay, what's what's going on here? Let's look at preconditioning. What are those graphs showing you? What are we seeing there? Preconditioning. Uh, it looks like uh, that the intake of water was about the same for both. And then when you were when they were made to feel sick afterwards, they were fine with water that wasn't flavored because it didn't have any anything to do with taste or anything like that. But water that was flavored, they didn't enjoy as much because it had flavoring. And then I guess for the foot shock one, my theory would be that because the shock was maybe, it might have been related, it might have been noisy or bright when they shocked the foot, it affected the visual and hearing for the bright noisy water and the flavor wasn't affected. So they were fine with the flavoring water. You got it. That that's exactly what what's happening. And just as as you were explaining, it's because the rats have this readiness to associate illness with taste, and a readiness to associate um, the physical harm with something you you see or hear. And that makes sense. Like when you're physically harmed in in nature, there's probably something you saw and heard that that did it. So this shows that um, this this sh uh, is evidence against the doctrine of equipotentiality that you can condition anything um, to any stimulus; they don't differ from each other. It, it shows that there's biological preparedness to form certain associations. 
this study was kind of like scientifically shocking for its time. Right? When when they did this study, when Garcia Garcia and Helling did this, study, they had a really hard time publishing it. Right? It was rejected over and over again. And uh, they were finally able to publish it. And now, you know, you hear about it in, in every intro psych class. But at the time, it really flew in the face of what psychologists believed. Because at the time, it was just unquestioned um, that you could condition uh, fear to any stimulus. And it was just the, the response that stamped in that association. Um, and and it, there was a time that psychologists weren't ready to to accept this, and it was um, quite a big deal back in the day. So biological influences put limits on what kinds of behaviors we can train through reinforcement. You can teach your cat maybe to shake paws with you. Maybe you could even teach it to use a toilet, but you're never going to be able to teach it to read or do calculus problems because it just can't do that. There's a biological limit on that. Um, another interesting observation is something called instinctive drifts. There are um, some famous animal behavior psychologists named, were called the, the Berlans, there were a couple. And they trained animals to do all kinds of things. So they, they trained pigs to put a coin in a piggy bank. Uh, but what's interesting is that the pigs sort of reverted to doing instinctive things with the coin to, to like um, kind of trying to like push it into the earth with their trunks. Like they, they were supposed to go put it in the piggy bank to get the reward, but they started behaving towards the um, coin um, as if it were food using their normal instinctive behaviors, right? Pushing around with their trunks. And um, they also tried to, to teach um, raccoons to, uh, to do this thing. But the raccoons, um, instead of doing what they were supposed to do, they, they reverted to doing raccoony things with coins with, um, you know, they, they, they want to Kind of rub them in their their hands. Uh, it's called rinsing, but it's not really. Um, raccoons um, are better able to feel underwater, and so when they're exploring their food, they like to put it underwater, um, and that helps them feel it. It's it's actually not about washing the food because they wouldn't do it with a filter. The the food anyway. Um, that's called instinctive drift, and um, this is why it's dangerous to be a lion tamer. So trained circus lions can suddenly revert to species typical behavior, which would be like attacking the lion tamer because it looks like food. And, and this has happened in the past. There are many ideas about learning in pop psychology in education that are not evidence-based or empirical, empirically validated. Um, those include um, sleep-assisted learning, accelerated learning, discovery learning, and um, learning styles. Sleep-assisted learning doesn't seem to work. That's when you maybe would uh, listen to your textbook while you sleep, hoping that you you learned some of it. And if that works at all, it's because it woke you up and you listened. Okay, if you're really asleep, you're not going to be processing that um, the way you need to in order to do well on um, on an exam although it may um, enter your dreams in weird ways. So you're, uh, I've, I've had that happen sometimes when leaving the radio on overnight and then having dreams that somehow incorporated what I was hearing on the radio. But um, what your brain's doing then when you're sleeping is, is not what you need it to do when you're studying. And so that, that doesn't seem to be helpful. However, sleep itself 
is important for learning. When you are sleeping, your hippocampi work on consolidating your long-term memory, right? And putting information into your long-term memory in a way that you can retrieve it later. So consider if you are staying up all night to cram for an exam, whether what you're learning from that cram session is actually going to outweigh the damage you're doing to your memory by staying up all night, right? That might be better to just sleep. Then um, there are programs that suggest that um, somehow you'll learn in, in a really accelerated way. Those also um, are not evidence-based. Discovery learning is the idea that instead of direct instruction, um, you could learn by figuring it out yourself. And um, what your textbook says is that this doesn't seem to be as effective as um, direct instruction, as just telling people what they need to know the way I'm doing right now. However, um, this is a game of averages. Okay, when we're looking at results from studies like that, it's about what works on average, maybe for the typical learner. And what I would add, um, my thoughts on this, is that maybe there are some students who do benefit more from, from that kind of hands-on learning where they figure it out for themselves from experiential learning. And, and if that didn't matter at all, then you know why would you do labs in, in any of your science courses? And so when you look at average effects, you could consider, okay, well, what's it, what's working in aggregate? And then, you know, who are, who are in the tails? Like maybe the average effect it cancels out the fact that this really doesn't work for some learners and really does work for some learners. And for most learners, it doesn't make that much difference. But what if what if it does work for some people? And the reason I was thinking about that was that, you know, we we uh, pathologize some people who say we pathologize students who don't seem to learn as well from direct instruction because there's this expectation that you should be able to learn well from what I'm doing now right now and that's not true for everyone otherwise some of you wouldn't have ADHD but that is a phenomenon so I wonder what if there are some people that do benefit from more experiential, hands-on discovery kind of learning. But for most people, most of the time, direct instruction seems to work better, and I think that's, that's quite good. It's also a lot easier for these. Like, imagine if I had to like run a bunch of labs right now. That would be so much more work than just blah blah didactically. Um, talking to an audience of 100 or 200 as if there was like I don't know, I feel like I'm talking to myself. This is the also the most convenient thing for the the instructor to do. You've probably heard of uh, learning styles. Okay. Do you identify as somebody who learns best by reading or writing, by some hands-on means, by listening? This is a bit of a pseudoscientific model. It, um, it has a lot of appeal. And sometimes it's connected to some like neuro myth about brain lateralization. This is actually a, a debunked theory, but it's people love it and it's really appealing, um, probably because of its values. Like it, it has values of, of inclusivity. Maybe that's why it's attractive. So papers that go and test the learning styles theories will often start out just like really positive about it. And then they set up the experiment and then the results kind of fall flat. And they try to stay hopeful about it, but there's just a lot of papers out there 
with uh, with null results. And so the the idea here is that let's say that if you're a, a visual learner, well then I should be showing you pictures, and and you'll learn from charts and graphs, and and that's the way you should consume information because that's what works for your learning stuff. And that if you're uh, one of these read write people, um, you know you do best from learning uh, from reading your textbook, and that's what you should go do. In reality. Uh, you're more likely to remember when you use more than one modality. Okay, so if you want to, let's say, study for this course, your best bet is to read the textbook, right? So visually, you're seeing those words. Get your highlighter out um, and, and handwrite. People are more likely to learn better when they take notes um, using their their hands than typing on a computer, and that may have to do with the way the the memory is stored. There's a, there's a lot less sort of effort in in typing with your fingers like that. Harder to form a, those associations than when you're actually um, tracing out letters. You know, um, yeah. So so go in there, get in your textbook, read it and look at the charts, draw them, uh, take your finger and trace things, right? So get it into your memory more than one different way. Read your textbook out loud to yourself because now you're going to remember your voice reading it and your eyes seeing it and you'll, um, you know, your, your hand tracing out letters and, and tracing out graphs. Get it in your brain four different ways. That's better than one different way. And when you need to pull that information out on the test, you hope that uh, one of those routes will work. So there, there are fads out there in, in learning. And what we need to do is, you know, do, do good studies, different kinds of studies and then look at the big picture of the results. That um, brings me to the end of the chapter uh, a little earlier than anticipated. So according to my adapted lecture schedule, I still would have been lecturing this on Monday, but um, we're done today and three minutes early at that. So, what I will do is cancel lecture on um, on Monday because I don't want, I'm gonna stick to the schedule and start lecturing the next chapter on Wednesday. So please you know, use that time to your advantage. Our, we have a midterm coming up in a couple of weeks that I've, now prepared that and um, if you have questions about that I can take those questions but uh, otherwise I'll I'll end the recording there and thank you for your attention